Welcome everybody to my talk. I am Dave Abrahams, and now I will put my tag down. Um, so uh, I normally don't start talks this way, but I've been away from the C++ community for a while, and some of you may not know me. So briefly, I started uh, with the C++ committee in 97, and am responsible for the fact that the standard library has exception safety. Um, then I was a founding member of Boost, and I also founded the first annual C++ conference, uh, known first as BoostCon, and uh, then later as C++ Now. And in 2013, I went to Apple, where I was one of the original creators of the Swift programming language. And uh, now I'm fortunate to be at Adobe, uh, which is an awesome place to work, where I get to pursue my professional mission which is to empower programmers. So that's why I'm here, to improve the tools you use when you develop software, including the mental ones. But first, real talk. People, we have a problem, and it's one we may not really like to face. In fact, we maybe can't even see it because we're swimming in it. It's like water to the fish. I'm talking about reference semantics. It's what you get when there are multiple paths to the same value. So if you've ever struggled with global variables, you know some of the pain that I'm talking about. The global is just a special case of reference semantics, a value that has a path from everything else. And as a culture, we seem to understand that global variables cause problems, right? And we've gotten pretty good about weeding them out of our code. But all the same issues apply to pointers and references. We don't seem to have quite grasped that. So first, there's an engineering cost. So designs just become more coupled, more rigid, and more fragile. Removing a global variable from a program can be hard, but the same goes for anything that's multiply referenced. And as with global variables, the temptation is always to keep adding data to these objects for convenience so that you can access it everywhere. And then you've locked yourself into what we call a reference hub. If you've ever worked on the LLVM sources, all of those contexts, those are a good example. <clears throat> Next, you got your implicit sharing. Now, we all know how this looks. X hands Y some piece of data, and Y says, thank you kindly, I'll just go about my business. And now X's local view of the world and Y's local view are each perfectly plausible but wrong when this is the reality. But it's a happy illusion. And as far as our heroes know, everything is still right with the world. Right? Until X, with its local view of reality, decides to replace its data with a giant squid. Now, why, why is everybody laughing? I can't understand. It seems perfectly natural to me. Now, from Y's perspective, everything is uh, normal until it goes to look for its data and finds monstrous tentacles. <laughs> okay. All right. We call this spooky action at a distance, with apologies to Einstein. In case you don't believe this problem is real, look for a technique called defensive copying which people use to avoid spooky action. It's all over object-oriented programming, for example. But it's inefficient, and like all patterns, it's error-prone. And this is just a really simple example. More likely, if you have reference semantics, your object graph looks something like this, in which a local action has a whole set of non-local consequences. Now, does this picture look like your system? If so, do you have a sense of control over those consequences? As Sean Parent likes to point out, there's an algorithm encoded in all these interactions. But it's hard to understand what's going on because the code is spread over many dynamically connected objects instead of being gathered into a function about which you can reason locally. It might even go into a loop. How do you know? 
Okay, now because we need to talk about invariance next, and I love the fundamentals, we need to make a brief digression. Uh, in the mid-1980s, Bertram Meyer, who has to be the coolest cat in object-oriented programming, just look at those sunglasses, man. So cool. Anyway, he came up with a discipline called design by contract. And some languages like Eiffel, his language, and D have features for contract checking. But the baseline requirement for this discipline is that contracts need to be documented. So in design by contract, a function's documentation covers at least three things. Preconditions, which are what's required from the caller. Postconditions, what's done and or returned by the callee. And invariants, which are conditions that are preserved by the call. Okay, having these three things allows clients to use it without diving into the function's implementation to see how it works. Local reasoning. It's required for correct software bigger than just a few files. And if you write correct software at scale, even if you don't use these words, you're using this discipline. Okay, invariants also extend to types, right? Every type has an invariant that's preserved by all the operations on the type. My favorite example is this type that holds two vectors and the invariant is that the vectors always have the same length, okay? Maybe it's a container that presents pairs of X and Y as elements, where storing actual pairs would waste lots of memory due to alignment and padding. So an invariant always has to hold for the program to be correct, with one exception, right? There is one time when invariants can break. That's during a mutation. If we want to add a new pair, we have to grow one of these vectors first, right? So the invariant will be broken. That breaks the invariant until we've done the other pushback. But so that's not a problem because the vectors are private and we encapsulate the invariant inside a mutating method that appends a pair, right? By the time that method returns, everything is back in order. But let's see what happens in our object graph. Say we're mutating the yellow object. If part of that mutation requires using another object, the chain can come back around to observe the original object with its invariance broken. So then I, I kind of need to mention race conditions, which are just what we call this problem when accesses are in different threads. Remember, references have all of the same problems as global variables. Right? So, you know, we all know the future is multi-core, and yet we keep building structures like this one, which are fundamentally hostile to concurrency. Finally, well, it's not final, there's more. <laughs> there's the way, even if we have an immutable pointer or reference, Mutation can still happen behind our backs, right? Somebody else has a mutable reference to the thing. So, and if all of these practical problems weren't enough for you, there's actually a deeper one. Let's take a look at this example, which is the simplest one I've found so far. I've got a generic function to offset one numeric value by another. And we want it to work efficiently on floats and arrays of floats, so we're passing delta by reference. Can we all agree that this should be considered correct code? This is the way we normally program. I promise you this isn't a trick. There's nothing up my sleeve here. Oh, what's the problem? Oh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Can we all agree that this is incorrect code? <laughs> Okay, so the problem that was just pointed out, I will repeat for the, for the room, uh, is that uh, I was supposed to be using X and I used target instead. So please mentally replace target in this whole presentation with X. <laughs> so. hmm. Okay. Um, okay, 
<clears throat> now I'm going to write a similar function that uses the first one. Now, this might not be the most efficient implementation, but it's equally correct, right? Offsets x twice by delta. Finally, as a sanity check, let's test this on an int. What does this print, anybody? Hmm? Anyone? Volunteers? Who said that? Ah, good. Okay, so it should print nine, right? That, that would be three plus two times three. That's nine, right? But it prints 12. Why? Because every time we offset x, we're also offsetting delta, right? As we go through, we've changed delta. So for the last mutation, delta was six. So something is very wrong. Even if you think offset and its documentation are okay, it clearly doesn't compose into offset two the way functions are supposed to. So how would you change the description of our offset functions effects, their post conditions, to account for this case? So I, I don't think you can, at least not without making the description so complicated that it's basically unusable. In fact, I'm pretty sure the very best we can do is to add this precondition. Right? It says that they're distinct objects. And this is not a unique example. Klaus showed the same problem using a different example in his Back to Basics talk. And the issue is everywhere in the standard if you look at the standard algorithms. For example, the effects of this replace call are unspecified, although the standard is maybe doesn't have the guts to come right out and say so, right? It's just <laughs> that if you read it really carefully, you can see that there's enough latitude for it to do almost anything. As one expert said to me, he said, it's well specified, but if the inputs overlap, you get what you get. <laughs> okay, uh, now let's update our list of problems and talk about safety for a moment. So reference semantics causes safety problems. I'm sure you all know this, but I mean something very specific. So a safe operation is one that can't cause undefined behavior. There are other ways you could define safety, okay? But this one is consistent with the usual expectation that if we violate safety in C++, we get undefined behavior. And it maps well onto what people mean when they claim a programming language is safe. This is the way in which Haskell is safe, for example. So by this definition, C++ isn't a safe language, of course, but there are safe operations, like incrementing an unsigned integer, right? Safety matters for two reasons. First, even the best programmers occasionally make mistakes. If their mistake use safe operations, the possible damage is bounded, at least, right? Either the program is stopped because maybe the error was detected, or it's executing some code that was actually in the program, right? With an unsafe operation, the program can do literally anything. Second, and painting with a broad brush, lots of programmers can't come to grips with undefined behavior. They don't know what it means, where it comes from, how likely it is, or what the consequences are. Let me show you what I mean. I bet real money that coding legitimately undefined behavior, whatever that means, will emit warnings and or code analyzer output. And this was said by an experienced senior C++ programmer in all seriousness. Okay, now when I said that undetectability by code analyzers is actually a reason that some things cause undefined behavior, they said I was just being pedantic. Oop, I need to go back. Uh, I'm sorry for the bouncing animations. We'll fix it in post. Oh, wow. I'm doing great. All right. 
never mind that man behind the curtain. All right. Um, so my point here is, even if you know better, lots of people don't and don't want to. And if you work with other people on software, you want safe operations. The alternative is just too unmanageable. So <clears throat> the two main safety problems associated with reference semantics are lifetime errors and race conditions. And solutions do exist, which I'll go through very quickly. Okay, the classic approach is to allocate everything on the heap and then use a garbage collector or reference counting to make sure an object never disappears while it's still accessible. And there's a lot of complexity and performance overhead in that. But if you really, really want reference semantics, it might be worth it. Rust uses a static approach that avoids allocation and lets you use special pointers and references in cases where you can prove to the compiler that mutable state is never actually shared. Right? It works, but the ergonomics aren't great and fighting the borrow checker has become a common meme among Rust programmers. Okay. Now, some people say you can take raw pointers and references as they are and use static analysis to make them safe. But the analyzers that can do that job without false positives and negatives, they don't exist today. So I'm not really sure if that counts as a, as a solution. For race conditions, I know of three basic approaches. First, you could just make the behavior defined and continue running like Java does, right? Just ignore that there's a problem there. You know, the defined behavior you get from Java, though, is basically useless, and it's almost certainly masking a bug in your code. So a more responsible approach is static, like what Rust does with the borrow checker, but again, Works great, but also kind of hard to use. Finally, uh, if you can't statically prove to Rust that you don't have a race, there's something called an atomic ref cell that you can use to bypass the borrow checker. And so it dynamically checks for race conditions, and it panics if one is found. So this costs an atomic, but you know, basically affordable. But, and halting the program is a totally legit way to avoid unsafety, right? Um, no undefined behavior occurred, especially, uh, but you, maybe you'd rather not find your bugs at runtime, especially if they're non-deterministic threading bugs, right? So to sum up, making reference semantics safe is possible, but it's non-trivial and you will be making trade-offs. Okay, stepping back. <clears throat> if you look at this list, it turns out that most of these issues are connected to mutation, and especially in languages where everything is by reference, people have seized on immutability as an answer. When you hear Haskell programmers talk about how it's hard to create bugs, believe them. Between their garbage collector and strict immutability, Haskell defines away most of these problems. Of course, giving up on mutation has costs too. It's just a bad fit for some problems to say nothing of for our mental model as programmers. This is a wonderful little paper about how hard it is to implement one of the oldest known algorithms in Haskell. Finally, the underlying machine has mutable memory and switching to a model where nothing is mutated can be super inefficient. To get that efficiency back, optimizers actually need to be smart enough to recreate the mutation, and they try to do that, um, but they often fail. So, but you know, immutability is really the only way to solve these problems in languages like JavaScript. In C++, we have alternatives. So this is what I'm left with. Okay, I believe there are deep truths in engineering. And I'm not talking about the pure abstract math kind of truth. What I mean is grounded in physical reality and in the constraints of our problems. And if you listen, the universe will help you find these answers. And in this case, 
it's telling us that reference semantics is a bad deal. Okay. Now, you may have noticed behind all of this, local reasoning is a bit of a theme. The clearest definition I've found is this informal one from Nathan Gitter. He says, local reasoning is the idea that the reader can make some, that the reader can make sense of the code directly in front of them without going on a journey discovering how the code works. So my brain has limited capacity, and I've found a lot of other people's brains are limited too. Not yours, of course. <laughs> but a lot of people's are, okay? And people like us can't keep the whole program in our heads. So of course, local reasoning is about more than just the problems with references, and it goes beyond programming, right? This is actually how humans deal with complexity. In fact, it's so fundamental that most of our programming best practices are there just to uphold it. It's why we make data members private, why we break programs into components like functions, types, and modules, and why we try to keep them small. Right? It's why we use class invariants and why we avoid global variables. Compilers use local reasoning too. If they can reason locally that data isn't being changed, they can keep it in registers and avoid refetching it from memory. That's just one example. A big part of the reason we get such a win from inlining is that the compiler has more local information to work with. But that strategy has limits, right? When the local scope gets uh, too large, compilers have to give up trying to draw these kinds of conclusions so we don't wait all day for the compilation to finish. Local reasoning is also why I don't have to be a physicist to program a computer. Here's what I mean. As programmers, we're working on what my friend Sam Lazarus calls a tower of abstraction that stretches through the libraries and programming language that we use, the operating system, and into the hardware, which ultimately rests on the laws of physics. So what keeps us from recursing down to the limits of known physics when we think about our programs? Well, the answer is documentation. Now, documentation gets no respect, but if you're old enough to remember when the STL came out, you know what a huge difference concise but meticulous documentation makes. For some of us, the STL revolutionized software development, and a huge part of what made it so powerful was the documentation. So it's pretty hard to find, because it gets no respect, it's pretty hard to find good quotes. But Alex Stepanov said in a seminar he gave at Adobe that all undocumented software is waste. It's a liability for the company. We can use libraries and our programming language without digging into their implementations because there's a solid spec. The compiler back-end back -end engineers can do their jobs because the hardware manufacturers document the arch architecture and instruction sets, right? The hardware designers succeed because the physicists documented the laws of physics. That's the tower, okay? And you're a part of it. The bad news, of course, is that you're not at the top of the tower. Someone else, or future you, is gonna have to build on the code you're writing. We're all library builders. So local reasoning and the documentation that supports it is required for correct software at scale. Right? We, we all want to write correct code. People's lives and their livelihoods are in our hands. So how can we uphold local reasoning? Fortunately, the solution is under our noses. It's value semantics. And I'm not kidding now. It's the future of programming. Value semantics is a property of types, like the integer types in C++. And people often describe it as doing as the ints do. right? But we really need a solid definition to get into it more. Whoa, that was a repeated key. Fantastic. OK, so value semantics is really the combination of two simple ideas. 
First, regularity is about the relationships between basic operations like copy assignment and equality comparison. Right? For example, a thing always has to be equal to itself and copying a thing has to make a thing that's equal to the original. Independence is about the visibility of mutation. It's the idea that when you have a variable, a value type, other code can't do anything to affect your locally visible value. And nothing you do to the value can be observed by other code, even if you pass it to another thread, as long as you don't form a pointer or a reference to it. So if you flip back to this slide, what we were really trying to rule out with this precondition, what we were really trying to ensure was independence. And it's not specific to this function, right? It hit me like a ton of bricks when I realized this. Without independence, the effects of any mutation can't be fully specified. So think about it for a second. You're mutating your parameters, right? And you can talk about that in your documentation, but you're also mutating some other stuff that you don't even have a way to describe. You don't have a name for it. So every single mutating operation from a single machine instruction to a database transaction really depends on independence for its correctness. It might be an unstated requirement, but it's there. But have you ever seen an independence requirement documented? I haven't. Thinking about why not led me to another realization, though. We just assume references are accessing independent values, either uniquely accessible for mutation or truly immutable. We take this shortcut because it's the only way to make sense of things. That's why we can't document the behavior of that strange replace call. So when we use references, we assume independence, but the compiler has a different view of the world, right? It has to play by the rules in the standard. So not only is it obliged to let clients do stuff that we're not prepared to handle, like mutating a thing that we're handling by a const reference, it also can't make any assumptions about which things might be changed by some opaque function call. And that means lost optimization opportunities. So I'm going to say something now that you won't hear very often from me. The standard is wrong, and you are right. Okay? Systems without independence are incredibly difficult to reason about, both for you and for the compiler. So the standard enshrines the wrong model. So don't change your mental model. Instead, document it. That means telling the clients of your APIs in one place that there is a blanket assumption of independence that they're expected to uphold when your APIs take a parameter by const reference or regular reference. No other code is allowed to modify the thing being referred to during the call. And if it's a mutable reference, uh, no other code is allowed to even inspect the thing being referred to. Now, None of that will help the compiler do better, but it will make it easier to avoid creating weird, unspecifiable behaviors. OK, back to value semantics. <clears throat> so one of the most important properties of value semantics is that in the same way that a composition of safe operations is safe, a composition of value types is a value type. And unlike with references, this composition always creates a whole part relationship, which matches our mental model for composing things. right? And it also maps on to the physical world. So this becomes this. Right? And now you can see that access to the parts requires access to the whole which is key to many of the awesome properties of values. Lastly, you can see that all of these operations have an obvious definition, right? Copying the whole means copying all of its parts, testing it for quality is done part-wise, and so on. In fact, I want you to take this opportunity, actually, to get some bad words out of your vocabulary, okay? I'm talking about deep 
and shallow. We only use phrases like deep copy when we don't understand the whole part relationships, the boundary of our value, because there is no such thing as deep copy. There's just copy, which copies all of the parts. And likewise, there's no such thing as a shallow copy. And the same goes for all these other operations, right? So I hope deep and shallow are red flags for you now. Think again about what you're saying. All right, so let's look at our list of problems again and see what gets solved by value semantics. So first, there's this technical debt problem, OK? The, the technical debt was caused by many paths to the same value, right? And with value semantics, you only have one path to the value. It's through its owner, through the thing it's, it's whole, it's a part of, right? Or you know, it's on the stack. Um, <clears throat> next, spooky action at a distance. Right? Well, you can't have a distant access to a thing. There's only one way to access it. Again, through the whole. Visibly broken invariance. Well, you can control what gets seen because there's no way of like looping back and, and observing this, the object that's under mutation. Race conditions are naturally and efficiently handled by value semantics. Right? There's just no sharing. And then this surprise mutation, right? That, that's off the list too. Lastly, the unspecifiable mutation problem goes away, right? If we replaced all of those, those references by values, we wouldn't be having that problem of them changing under us while we're doing our work. Okay. <clears throat> so, Fortunately for us, C++ has value semantics. How about that? Right. Um, so it's supported because, you know, in three different ways. First, pass by value gives the callee an independent value. Second, a returned value is independent in the caller. Right. And lastly, those default operations like copy and, you know, when you equal default something, it naturally composes and upholds the properties of value semantics. So supporting value semantics is actually a rare and valuable thing. It's a forgotten wisdom from languages like Pascal and Ada. For 30 years during the OO revolution, almost every language was based on reference semantics. And here's a fun fact. UML actually has a first class notation for whole part relationships. So they clearly knew it was important. And yet, as far as I know, nobody ever puts support for whole part relationships into any object oriented language. Unfortunately, though, there is a fly in the ointment. C also undermines value semantics by achieving independence through copying, which prompted this quote. Chris said to me one day, C++ has value semantics, but nobody uses it. And what Chris meant was that because C++ makes copies so eagerly, nobody really wants to pass things bigger than an int by value. It's a disincentivizing design choice. Okay, And it's true in other ways. There are places we'd like to use value semantics like in place mutation, where the only choices are pointers and references. Right? So everything exposes some reference semantics. But there is a way to do mutation that upholds value semantics. So here we have a simple sort function that works on a vector of ints and just dispatches to std sort. And for testing, we declare a vector and a comparison function. And here's our test. OK? Now, notice that some incredibly unrealistically conscientious person has actually documented for us that S and compare need to be independent. Otherwise, this call to sort would cause undefined behavior. Now let's create a statically enforced independence so we can delete that line of documentation. First, we need to remove the reference from our argument. 
but then return the same type we were mutating. And if our return type hadn't been void, then we could package the result into a tuple. And now we actually have to return S, right? And we can fix the documentation. Uh, here's returning S and drop this requirement. And at the, at the call site, you have to reassign V. So this form is what's known as a functional update. And it's a general transformation you can use on any mutating function. Of course, because this is C++ and we need to explain everything to the compiler, there's one more thing we have to do to make it efficient, which is add a move, okay? So pass by value is part of C++'s built-in support for value semantics, and here we leveraged it to do a mutation with true independence. Of course, nobody is gonna do all of their mutations this way, right, because it's a hassle. Now, here's something else nobody else is gonna do. This declares a simple non-mutating function written in the most straightforward way. And if you take this into a code review, someone will helpfully point out that the expensive copy that's implied by passing that vector by value. And they'll tell you to rewrite it using a const reference. The irony here is now we've given up independence. Inside the function, we don't have any guarantee that it's not also referenced. That const reference doesn't prevent the predicate or any other code from, uh, maybe even in a different thread, from mutating the thing that S refers to. <clears throat> so, okay. All of that rewriting for uh, the functional update syntax was, is kind of a pain. Suppose, though, we had a language feature that would give us efficient update semantics, right, with the move and everything else but avoid uh, that reassignment at the call site. And let us rewrite the code basically the same way. I would call it in out. So let's replace that reference with my new keyword. And the compiler would rewrite my declaration of sort to use pass by value and return the updated result. And then would re rewrite my call to sort as a functional update. Okay, anyway, this is basically the mutation model that Swift uses except that there's no need for that move. And you'll see why in a minute. And there's a matching convention called in for doing pass by value without a forced copy, right? Or you could think of it as pass by const ref with the guarantee of independence. It looks like this. Okay, now there's one last thing that you need to make all of this work, and that's a law of exclusivity, where the compiler doesn't let you pass to an in-out argument unless it can prove it's the only access. This law is the invention of my good friend, John McCall, who was on the Swift project with me. Um, this is the original example that we saw, except using in-out and in instead of references. And if you use it, you get an error right where the problem originates. Right, and it can even fix up the code for you. Lastly, let me point out that there's a virtuous cycle at work here, right? In outs don't need to be moved in order to be unique and can be forward to, forwarded to another in out without an, another move. So this is why Swift doesn't have to do that move in the first place. Or they can be forwarded to in as references. Ins can be forwarded to other ins without any checking. Right? And the extra local reasoning provided to the compiler means it can optimize better, including eliminating more dynamic safety checks if you happen to have them. Yeah, looks like we may finish. <clears throat> okay, so how can you achieve value semantics today? Say you have, if, if you have a messy graph like this one, you know, full of mutable objects. Here we have an array of pointers to some data structures, and some of the elements in that array may point to their siblings. And we also have external references into the elements of the array, right? That thing isn't reachable through the array. The point is, we found ourselves in some kind of messy, tangled thing. So how do we start? Well, first, we identify the whole part relationships in our graph. And how do you do that exactly? Well, 
you have to decide what your what constitutes the value of your type. And that's something that the, that's really up to the type author. And what they decide reflects and determines what the type means. So here's uh, an example. I'll try to go through it really quickly. Um, the heavy purple box surrounds the, the bits of a widget, right? Those are the bytes in memory. But what's the value? Well, that depends on how the widget's author understands its meaning. In this case, I'm the author, so I'm going to give you the answers, but the answers might be different for another, another type that had the same diagram, right? So first, we have nameland, which determines the number of significant elements in the name array. The name is part of the value, so nameland is clearly a part. I'm going to color it yellow. Next, we have the name itself. Now, I consider two widgets that have different pointers to equal name data of equal length to be equal. So the name itself, that pointer, is not part of the value. Next, there's the data pointed to by name. Exactly name len elements of that data is part of the value. Right? And finally, we have a pointer to some shared cache. Widget uses this cache to respond to queries faster or something, but the cache doesn't actually affect what widget does, except to make it faster. So neither the cache nor its pointer are part of the value. And voila, I just determined the value of my type by identifying its whole part relationships. Now let's get back to our object graph. We've identified the whole part relationships, which I've painted in red. Note, this is always forms a tree. Okay. Remember, whole part relationships imply that there's a single access to a thing, thus a tree. So the next step is to turn that tree into nested boxes. Now, in that new mental view, the boxes are values, and the nesting represents our whole part relationships. The arrows that remain denote other kinds of relationships, right? Let's call them extrinsic relationships, for lack of a better word, which you have to represent some other way. So let's assume you stick to your pointers and references for the moment. <clears throat> because the boxes should represent values, you now have to be able to write an equality operation between two boxes of the same type. And that operation should make sense in the, in the absence of extrinsic relationships it should have been synthesizable with equal default right, by the compiler. The equality of an aggregate is just the equality of its parts. But if you do have extrinsic relationships represented with pointers, then the values of the referred objects can't be part of the equality relation. right? Only the identity of those pointers can. And whether that's true or not is a decision you have to make. Think about it, if the value of those extrinsic objects were part of the equality relation, then they would form a whole part relationship, right? It's sort of tautological. <clears throat> now, if you do have um, uh, extra slide, okay. Now, <clears throat> the problem with pointers is that they represent a relationship while also creating another access path to something that's not a part. So although you might have independent values at this point, the pointer opens a back door for reference semantics to sneak in. So if you want to do this completely, you need to reframe those extrinsic relationships as something that doesn't grant access. One simple way to do that is to give every object an identity in the form of an int and use that identity instead of a pointer. Right? That int might represent an index into an array or might be looked up in, a, in a, uh, some kind of map. Right? And that's a pretty straightforward approach. But there's one problem with it that's surely going to bother some people in this room. And that is that there's nothing that prevents us from using that identity to index into the wrong array. Right? In other words, we lost the type information that was carried along with your pointer. So you can easily get around that problem by tagging your identity with the type it's pointing to. Right? So we'll just wrap an int in a very little 
template. OK, but sometimes you have object graphs in which there simply are no whole part relationships. How can we deal with those? Well, you can use an adjacency list. And the simplest representation of adjacency list that I know is a vector or vector of integers. So the outer vector has one entry for every vertex in the graph, right? Each element of the inner vector represents an edge. For example, the edge from A to B is represented like this. And the one from A to C, like that. Okay, from there you can probably guess the representation of the rest of the graph. All right, now this, this might look foreign to some people. It's actually a very common way to describe graphs. In fact, that's the uh, most common representation used by the Boost Graph Library, which implements high-performance graph algorithms. So this is a performant representation, and until very recently, Boost Graph was the state of the art in performance. Um, and what, what took over also, also uses this. So, okay. And of course, now we can use our graph just like any value, right? It's a value, it has value semantics. So we could reason about its mutation because it's independent, just like an int. Now, I'm sure that some of you may feel uneasy at this point. I know this is different. It doesn't look what, like what you might be used to. And let's be upfront, this discipline has a real cost. You have to give up the convenience of direct access from one object to the parts of another. That does change the way we program things. But in exchange, you and your compiler get to reason about your code and make it correct and fast. That's a pretty good deal in, in the long run, right? Reference semantics is kind of like crack. It's sweet, it's easy, and the first one is free, right? <laughs> but then you take a look at your code and you realize you can't reason about it anymore. I can give you examples. Um, my colleague Dimitri uh, here, he started writing his compiler with reference semantics and he hit the ground running and you know, was, was chugging along at great velocity and then he hit all of the problems. Eventually we sat down and redesigned the whole thing from the ground up with value semantics, and many of those nasty problems he had had just disappeared. Okay. Now, what if we need to create a new type? Right, this is not existing code. The easiest way is to just aggregate other value types. Remember that value semantics compose. But what if you really want, for some reason, to point at some data anyway? Well, then you have sort of two choices. First, you can implement the rule of five operations so that the copy constructors and assignment operators preserve value independence, right? Or if you want to mitigate the cost of copying, you can implement copy on write. And I'm not going to show an example of that here. Okay. Somehow, I have extra slides. Hmm. So, I think we were about at the conclusion, and I wrote a fantastic conclusion. Fantastic, really. And, <laughs> and now I'm looking at, the, at, uh, at this blank slide. Huh? <laughs> Sorry? The future of programming is blank? Uh, no code. Uh, yeah, yeah, well. Um, all right, let me see what I can find. Sorry, please be patient. How did this happen? Huh? Here, I got it. Okay. 
Here are our takeaways. Okay, first, slide navigation and preparation is hard. Okay. Now, first, embrace value semantics. So yes, I'm seriously arguing that the most important thing we can do for programming in 2023 is to propagate and uphold the properties of the integer types, the ones that we inherited from KNRC in a previous century. Value semantics is basic, right? It's boring, it's fundamental, but it is the future of programming. It's the simplest path to local reasoning. It's one that doesn't require countless annotations and isn't alien to the C++ type system. It's the only known path to local reasoning that actually scales. And it's the path to safe and efficient exploitation of multiple cores and heterogeneous compute. It's the only path to correct mutation as we demonstrated. Done right, it's faster. What more could you want, really? So next, enshrine your mental model for references when you do have to use them, right? That the compilers, the standard didn't quite get it right. And a, a plea to committee members, please don't nibble around the edges. Consider features like in and in out that uphold local reasoning and efficiently provide safety by construction. So value semantics does lead somewhere exciting, even if it is boring on its own, if you push it to its limits. And I've been collaborating on a language project called Val that's focused on value semantics, generic programming, and interop with C++ um, that I think really could go somewhere. And my colleague Dimitri uh, here is, is going to give this talk called Val Wants to Be Your Friend. Um, I suggest you all go if you're curious about this. Thanks very much, and I'm ready for questions. Yeah, so thanks for the talk. Uh, I have one, uh, maybe maybe challenge. You said uh, value semantics is the future of programming. Yeah. Um, so what, what would you say about um, reference semantics with the right amount of static analysis is the future of programming. And why I'm saying this is, I kind of noticed that all the problems that, you, that you've shown, including all the examples, would kind of be fundamentally impossible in Rust. Like you cannot have a function that gets a mutable and a non-mutable reference to the, same mem sorry, to the same memory, and then you kind of run into these problems. So this is kind of impossible. And also I have the feeling that your in-out operator is kind of a bit of like the Rust reference in C++, kind of the Rust layer, because like in the end, if you have in out, you don't really have to move the object and move it in and move it out, but instead the compiler All can right. just turn it over. In, in the interest of time, do you mind if I interrupt? And, and yes, I'm, I'm done. Okay. So, so you're absolutely right. A, a lot of this is solving the same problems that Rust solves, okay? Um, and if we wanted to switch languages, uh, Rust might be a, a great choice. I think, you know, Val has, has some merits that are different from Rust's. We have a different outlook we, on pointers and references. And, um, and I, I hope you go to Dimitri's talk so that you can actually uh, weigh those two things side by side. But for C++, yeah, this is a path to solving some of those problems that you have in Rust. Of course, we're not talking about uh, introducing a borrow checker or a uh, or named lifetimes. So maybe some of the ease of use that you don't have in this. We have a question online. Uh, do you consider iterators, spans, and ranges to be reference semantics, and should we avoid them? Well, should we avoid them? Uh, I mean, everything, you know, the, the standard library, everything in C++ is full of reference semantics. Some of the best components that we have are full of reference semantics. So I'm not going to tell you to avoid those things. You do need to be aware of the risks that you're assuming when you, when you pick them up, right? And yes, I would consider them as exposing reference semantics. Thanks. 
Thanks for the talk. Can you comment on how <clears throat> value semantics might apply to things that otherwise would be move-only types, like a, like there is only one console, for instance, for the application or a thread or a file or something like that? Please go to the uh, Val wants to be your friend. That's where we're, we're covering that. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, that's another you know frustration of mine with C++. And, and I'm responsible for, you know, at least partially responsible for move semantics in C++. I don't like that we have to write move. And another thing I especially don't like, I should have listened to David Van Der Voort on this, is that, you know, when you're going to consume something, you take it by reference. <coughs> so anyway, go to the Val talk. Thanks. Another question online. You had a quote, undocumented software is waste. Do you envision languages expressive enough to document themselves, for example, via contracts? For example, via contracts. Uh, no, uh, I don't envision that. Contracts can, well, I mean, partially, right? You can, you can move more and more of the specification into the, into the core language. So, um, but contracts can't express everything. There are preconditions that you just can't test for. Right, so, so there's that. Also, uh, what I've seen, at least so far, is that languages that do try to let you, you know, specify everything about the semantics in code are incredibly hard to use, um, and at least hard to, hard to prove. So we have some ideas for Val, and you should ask that question again in, in the Val session. Thank you for the talk. I'm interested in the example where you changed the tree node pointer type to an integer. As far as I understand, that has very pragmatic benefits, you know, serialization, hashing, whatever. But to me, it's still conceptually reference semantics. You are still referencing something through that integer, right? So can you elaborate a bit on that and yeah. if you actually achieve value semantics by yeah. doing that? The, the key thing there is that, that that is a relationship, right? Just like a reference is or a pointer, but it doesn't grant you access through that thing, mm -hmm. which is where all of the problems with reference semantics come from, is having an additional access path. To so, so the benefit is that the access is delayed to some other place later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the model for, for example, the model for iterators in C++, you know, it's a brilliant design. It's not safe, <laughs> and it, it's not value semantics, right? Um, you have to dereference this pointer-like thing. What we did in Swift is we generalized the relationship of position in the thing to something like a like a generic index in the same way that STL has a generic pointer that's the iterator. We have a generic index. So it might not be an int, but it's an index. And then you always have the collection there to mediate access, right? The whole that whose part you're accessing. Uh, in general, value semantics seems to be a, uh, quite a useful and powerful approach. I do wonder if it's always worth it, uh, keeping in mind uh, debuggability issues, uh, something like the uh, adjacency uh, vector or uh, somewhat reminiscent of it, various UI systems with lots of objects uh, referring to each other. Uh, there are, from my experience, much harder to uh, debug, you know, with breakpoints and everything, once you don't actually when you're not actually able to see them pointing to each other. So how would you address this issue? Um, well, mostly, so what I found is that 99% is that of the relationships in, in a program are whole part relationships. And so those things collapse into nested boxes, and those are extremely easy to, to debug. It's just debugging access, access to the member of a struct. Right? And then there are the other ones. And the other ones, I think, you know, reference semantics is hard to, hard to handle no matter what. But it's tr probably true that debuggers today are set up to easily let you inspect that object that's being related to, right? And you would have to, I've, I've actually had this problem, right? So you do have to build some infrastructure or, you know, shortcuts or debugger macros to, to let you, you know, find the, the part that some ID refers to if you want to go fast. Otherwise, you can just write the expressions out. 
it's not it's not the end of the world but yeah there like I said before there are trade-offs with this approach right and so there are going to be things that are less convenient I can't read that. Sorry. What does it say? It's session's over. over. <laughs> I'm over. You're done. <laughs>